that T satisfies the weak boundedness property, and T of one and T star of one belong to BMO. So for now, once again, the convention of T star is just a transpose. It's not uh, Hermitian adjoint. There's no complex conjugation at this point, okay? And the second thing is that T is bounded on L2. All right, so a couple of remarks are in order. Um, so let's try to put a little perspective on this theorem. Remember that we have this theorem of Petrie, Span, and Stein. Uh, I don't remember the numerology of it now, but there was only one theorem with those three guys. All right, which said that if T is bounded on L2, then T maps L infinity into BMO. And in fact, uh, of course, if just by basic Hilbert space theory, if T is bounded on L2, so is T star, and therefore also T star maps L infinity into BMO, okay? On the other hand, suppose that you don't necessarily know a priori that T is bounded on L2, but you do know for some reason that T and T star map L infinity into BMO. Well, dualizing the estimate for T star, then you also get that T maps Hardy space H1 into L1. And then interpolating, there's a version of interpolation due to Pfefferman and Stein where BMO can substitute for L infinity as an endpoint and H1 can substitute for L1, and you pick up all the LPs in between. In particular, you pick up L2. So then you get that T maps L2 to L2. Okay? So what's the T of one theorem saying? It's saying that you don't have to test T and T star on all of L infinity. You only have to test them on a very, very special function, which is the constant function one. Okay? All right. Uh, well, except with one additional, but as we've seen, sort of mild hypothesis, which is the weak boundedness property. Right, remember we saw that weak boundedness automatically holds if you're looking at the principal value operator associated to an anti-symmetric kernel, which our examples often happen to be. In fact, for the examples that we've discussed, Cauchy integral operator and the Calderon commutators, they are anti-symmetric. Okay? All right. So the second remark is that the direction Two implies one, right? That the L2 boundedness implies the first thing. We already know this. Okay? Because Petrie Span Stein tells us that T and T star map L infinity to BMO. So in particular, they map one into BMO because one is an L infinity. And we've also seen that L2 boundedness trivially gives you weak boundedness property just by Cauchy-Schwartz, okay? Okay, so the real content of the theorem is to prove that one implies two, all right? So last comment before we go to the proof. Uh, there's an issue, if you don't already know boundedness from L infinity to BMO, then what do we mean by T of one? Well, this is one of the exercises, but I'll just say a brief word now, that you define T of one as an element of the distribution's modulo constants, which means, in other words, that it's in the dual space of what I'll call D zero, D0 is going to be this set of psi and C0 infinity with mean value zero. Okay? 
and you can make sense then by sort of mimicking when you test t of 1 against such a psi, that means because psi has mean value of 0, you're going to be able to subtract an appropriate constant. Okay? And then you sort of mimic the proof of the petri span stein theorem. All right? And that's, that's how you prove it. And there's, there's just a, a little bit of work, but not much, to verify that the thing is actually well-defined. Right? The idea with petri span stein was to split your function f into a local part plus a far away part. And somehow you need to, to, to get well-defined in this, you need to verify that really what the thing that you're defining is independent of the particular splitting that you make. But that's, that's not hard, okay? And that's the exercise. All right, so let's proceed to the proof. All right, so now we're going to use Littlewood-Paley theory, all right? So we're going to introduce our usual sort of nice little wood Paley operators that give us a color own reproducing formula. So let QSF equal zeta S star F, zeta S as usual, S to the minus N, uh, zeta of X over S. I'm not sure why I'm using S. I, I'm going to be switching to T in a moment, but I hope that's not confusing. Uh, we want to have, um, zeta in C0 infinity of, wow, just for a slight amount of convenience, I'll choose it to be sporting the ball of radius a half rather than one that doesn't really matter. And with mean value zero, and we're going to choose zeta to be real and radial, and non-trivial, of course. And then, as we've seen, in those circumstances after a normalization, we get the color and reproducing formula, right? Okay, for those, that family of QSs, okay? All right, <clears throat> so now I'm going to define an operator PT, which is going to be this guy, all right? And it turns out, well, first of all, notice that as t goes to zero, this guy is approximating the identity, at least in L2, because that's, that's the meaning of, of this statement. Okay? Okay? But one can actually say more. I'm going to omit the proof here. It's in the notes. It's not, it's just a sort of elementary real variable argument with a, based on some changes of variables, and using the fact that you're dealing with a, a radial guy, okay? What you can show is that PT, in fact, is a, is a standard mollifier, a, a nice approximate identity, okay? So in fact, PTF is phi T star F, phi T defined in, in the usual way, with phi in C0 infinity, real, radial, supported in the unit ball. That's why I made this support a half, because then this was in the unit ball, all right? If we made that one the unit ball, this would be the ball of radius two. Doesn't really matter. Uh, and the integral of phi is one, okay? So you get a very nice standard mollifier, nice approximate identity, okay? And as I say, I'll omit the proof here to save time, but you can find it in the notes and it's not hard, okay? All right, so a couple of further sort of easy remarks about, about this PT. Of course, we can see because because PT is a standard mollifier, we know that it converges to the identity in strong operator topology on B of L2, okay? We also have we also have that um, that PTF converges to F pointwise almost everywhere 
for f in L2, say. And in fact, everywhere for f continuous. But moreover, we also, and again, this is as t goes to 0. But also, if pt of f converges to f in d for f and c0 infinity. That's routine to check. And one more thing, which is that the limit as r goes to infinity of t of pr of f, pr of f, pr of g, I should say, is 0 for f and g in c0 infinity. And this is a consequence of the weak boundaryless property. And the fact that pr, this operator pr, is mapping um, L1 to L infinity with norm R to the minus N. Okay? You combine that fact with uh, the weak minus property and yeah, you get it. Okay? Again, the details, well, I don't know. Maybe I didn't put the details in the notes, but it's, it's not hard. I guess it's an informal exercise. It's not on the official exercise list. Okay, so if we combine these facts together, what does that say? It says that, okay, so let f and g be in C0 infinity, and our goal is to show that if we make this pairing initially defined in the sense of distributions, that there's some uniform constant depending on well, dimension and uh, calderon zygmunt estimates for the kernel and the uh, BMO norm of T1, T of 1 and T star of 1 and the constants of the weak bounded property, you know, all that usual stuff, then this should be bounded by the L2 norm of F times the L2 norm of G. Because if you can do that for all F and G in this dense subspace of L2, then, um, then you would just make an extension by continuity and that T extends to a bounded operator in L2, okay? All right, so let's look at this. Because of what we've said here, we can obtain this thing as a limit as epsilon goes to zero of the integral from epsilon to one over epsilon of, let me say it this way, d by dt of pt t pt f g dt, right? Because you just integrate out and use these facts. Oh, and one other fact, that the conditions on PT make it self-adjoint, so putting the PT here is no different than putting the PT here. Okay? Right? Oh, I think I'm missing a minus sign, right? Right, there should be a minus sign, because we get the identity on this end and zero on this end. Okay, so now we take this derivative and notice what we get from differentiating this integral here. We get that this equals limit as epsilon goes to zero, integral from epsilon to one over epsilon of qt squared t ptf g dt over t plus the same thing, uh, let's see, 
the same thing with a PT here, T QT squared F G. And again, the measure is DT over T. Okay? All right. Now I claim that these two terms are essentially of the same form. Okay, so let's give these a name. Let's call it one epsilon of F and G plus two epsilon of F and G. Okay? So for example, let's look at two epsilon of F and G. All right, as we said, the PT is self-adjoint, so you can bring it over here. You can bring T over, it becomes T star. And you can bring one of the QTs over. The QTs are also self-adjoint, they're real and radial, okay? And so this becomes integral epsilon to one over epsilon. Um, QTF, QT of T star of PT of G, DT over T. But notice that if we brought the QT over here, this is the same, exactly of the same form as this term, only interchanging the roles of F and G and the roles of T and T star. But everything is symmetric here, so if you can handle one, you can handle the other, okay? All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's not hard. Yeah. Um, it's because. Yeah, it's it's right. It's in the distribution sense because, um, you know, the PT is also given by a C zero infinity thing. Right, and so you're still, and whether you have PT or the derivative of PT, everything that you have here is always of the form, you know, T applied to a thing in D paired with a thing in D, and it's, and it's easy to justify using that. Okay. Okay, so therefore it's enough to treat the term one. Okay, all right. So it's enough to treat the term one epsilon. And in fact, it's enough to show the bound that we're after for one epsilon as long as it's independent of epsilon, okay? So our goal now at this point is to show that the soup over epsilon bigger than zero of one epsilon of FG is less than or equal to some permitted constant times the L2 norm of F times the L2 norm of G. Okay? So then, let's look at that guy. Again, we're gonna move one of the QTs over onto the G. And then, notice that this pairing is no longer merely a distributional pairing. It's actually, it can actually be understood as an integral, okay? So, that's because, right, when you, when you modify a distribution, you actually have a function, okay? 
So one epsilon of fg is equal to integral from epsilon to one over epsilon integral on Rn of Qt T Pt of f of x integrated against Qt g of x dx dt over t. And we're going to bring absolute values all the way in at this point and then use Cauchy-Schwartz. And when we use Cauchy-Schwartz, we might as well, once we bring the absolute values in, we might as well integrate from zero to infinity. So for sure, any bounds we get will be independent of epsilon. And here we have QTT PTF squared dx dt over t to the one half times the same thing. with QTG of x squared. And let's give these a name, let's call them A times B. Okay, and so notice that term B by the, by the basic Littlewood-Paley theorem for very nice convolution type QTs, I guess that was what, proposition 2.6. Double check me on the numerology, but I think that's right. We get that B is bounded by the L2 norm of G. Okay, right, that's immediate. So, what, are, what we've boiled things down to is that A is less than or equal to the L2 norm of F. So notice what we've got here. What we've got is a square function, and if I call this thing QTT, PT, if I call this thing theta T, it is of a sort of a familiar appearance to what we've been working with. All right? So in other words, we need to show this. where theta t is qt, t, p, t. Just the composition of those three operators. So at this point you can probably guess where this is going. All right, we're gonna prove this by using the t of one theorem for square functions. All right, maybe I should give this a name. Let me call this, this thing star, okay? So to prove star, by the T of one theorem for square functions, this was, I think, again, not super confident about the numerology, but I think it was 3.1. Uh, what we need to show are two things. First, that this guy has a kernel, which satisfies the standard Littlewood-Paley kernel conditions, okay? So we, it's enough to show. But one, Theta t has a kernel, psi t of xy in the Littlewood-Paley class, all right? 
So we have a little with Paley family, I mean, all right? And second, that the measure d mu of xt given by theta t of one of x squared dx dt over t is a Carlson measure, right? Those were the two hypotheses of that t of one theorem for square functions. Once we have these two things, we're done. All right. Now the second one is essentially immediate. <clears throat> All right. Because recall that PT of one equals one. Again, because the kernel phi t had integral one, okay? And also, t of one is in BMO. All right, so therefore, qt of t of pt, so let me write it this way. Theta t of one is qt t pt of one. pt of one is one, so this is qt of t of one, but this is in BMO, okay? So therefore, the Carlson measure estimate is immediate now from the Pfefferman-Stein lemma that you proved as an exercise, okay? And I think, if I remember the numerology there is 222 maybe in the notes, okay? So that part's easy. Um, part one is longer and more complicated. I think because time is short, I won't go through the details of that, but they are in the notes. But let me just make a couple of comments. So <clears throat> what you want to do, okay, maybe I should tell you what the, what the kernel looks like, all right? So you split into two cases. First, where the distance between x and y is, say, at least 100 times t, and second, where the distance from x to y is less than 100 times t. Okay, now in this case we have separation and we can write out explicitly what the kernel looks like as an absolutely convergent integral. Okay. So this kernel is going to be, well, it's a convolution of qt with t of pt, all right? So this will be zeta t of x minus z, say. Then integral of k of, let's say, z and v, the kernel for the singular integral. And then the kernel for pt, which is phi t of v minus y, and then we have dv, and then dz, okay? Right, because if we apply this to a function f, integrating in y, this will give you pt of v. Applying this gives you t of pt of, sorry, pt of f. Applying this, integrating here gives you t of pt of f, and integrating here gives you qt of t of pt of f. And this is legitimate because notice that that um, 
if x minus y is bigger than or equal to 100t, then z minus v is bigger than or equal to, let's say, 98t, right? By the triangle inequality, since each of these guys, zeta t and phi t in particular, is supported in a ball of radius 1, or ball of radius t, okay? All right, and so we have, we have separation here, and this is an absolute convergent integral, right? The kernel is away from its singularity. Okay, and then what do you do? Okay, you do a thing that we've done a few times now. You use the cancellation here, which allows you to subtract off so we can replace k of z v by k of z v minus k of x v. All right, and then you use the calderon zygmunt condition and you go through. The smoothest condition in the little, that'll give you the little wood paley size condition. The smoothest condition, you need to only verify it in the y variable, and so then you just work with the gradient of phi t instead of phi, and then, and again, you get things rather easily. Okay, again, the details are in the notes, uh, but that's the idea. For case two, the idea is somehow to use the weak modernist property, right? You're not, in case two, you don't get to write this out as an absolutely conversion integral, right? Because you don't have separation, you know, you're not away from the diagonal there, okay? So I'll just say briefly, then in case two, Use weak boundedness. Okay? And again, the details here are in the notes. All right? And that's the proof of the theorem. Okay? So, except for this kind of, you know, not deep and difficult, but technically messy business of verifying the kernel conditions, it actually turned out to be a